Ja, dann auch von mir herzlich willkommen. Ihr wisst schon, mein Teil ist der deutsch gesprochene Teil hier. Ähm, als Schulleiterin der GSSV denke ich immer, wenn wir zurückblicken auf das letzte Jahr, und das haben wir vergangene Woche gerade in, in der Mitgliederversammlung gemacht, was uns besonders gut gelungen ist, ist, wenn wir die Pandemie nicht nur negativ gesehen haben, sondern geguckt haben, was jetzt möglich ist durch die Pandemie. Und möglich ist auf jeden Fall, äh, weiter Professoren aus Potsdam zuzuschalten vom HPI oder wo auch immer die HPI-Professoren sich gerade äh, in der Welt aufhalten. Äh, Joanne aus New York äh, wird auch noch mal bei uns sein, später in diesem Jahr zur Studienberatung. Und was ich letzte Woche schon angekündigt habe, als Stefanie Müller da war mit ihrem super interessanten Vortrag, da konnten wir gar nicht aufhören mit der Q&A-Session, ist, dass ähm, Professor Baudisch ihr Doktorvater war. Also auch die beiden haben zusammengearbeitet irgendwann mal. Und heute gucken wir aber in die Zukunft. Und das ist ja besonders spannend natürlich. Also ich sage mal so, wenn Sachen, ja, das hätten wir aber so machen müssen. Ich mal als Physikerin kann ich nicht sagen, wir finden, erfinden eine Zeitmaschine. Aber mal in die Zukunft zu gucken, darauf bin ich ganz besonders gespannt. Und deswegen begrüße ich euch alle ganz herzlich, Sie alle ganz herzlich und freue mich auf den Vortrag. Übergebe aber erst an John Halpern aus New York, die in bewährter Weise den Professor inhaltlich vorstellt. Thank you, Katrin, and to the GISSV team for organizing today's event. And um, now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Patrick Baudisch is a professor of computer science at the Hasso Plattner Institute in Potsdam, Germany, and chair of the Human and Computer Interaction Lab. After working on mobile devices, touch input, and natural user interfaces for many years, his current research focuses on personal fabrication and in particular, laser cutting. Previously, Patrick Baudisch worked as a research scientist in the Adaptive Systems and Interaction Research Group at Microsoft Research and at Xerox PARC. He has a PhD in computer science from Darmstadt University of Technology in Germany. He was inducted into the Chi Academy in 2013 and has been an ACM Distinguished Scientist since 2014. Since 2019, he's been the chair of the Sig Chi Research and Practice Awards Subcommittee. Professor Baudisch's past PhD students include Professor Stephanie Müller from MIT, whom you met last week, um, Christian Holz, Pedro Lopez, Lung Pan Cheng, and Alex Ion. Um, and all of them are now professors at ETH Zurich, University of Chicago, NTU, and Carnegie Mellon University, respectively. Um, Professor Baudisch, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. All right. Um, okay, your cameras are off, so I, I don't really see much what's going on, but um, uh, I guess that's normal, right? That the cameras are off. I kind of like it when I see you, but feel free to kind of activate the cameras when you feel like it. So, all right. I didn't bring any slides today. I don't know if you if you if you feel like you need more PowerPoint in your life. Let me know. Um, I just brought a demo of something we're working on right now. Um, but um, given that some of you at least are in, Sil in the Silicon Valley, thank you, very good. Um, so I used to live on, it took me a moment to remember it, 3084 Emerson uh, in Palo Alto. And um, I think it's a parallel street to El Camino, if I recall correctly. And um, it was interesting to, to, to move there. I moved there in, I think, 2000. And, um, the lab had paid me one week of hotel to figure out where to live. Uh, we were staying at the Hotel California, which I had previously only known from some 1960s pop song, which probably was a different Hotel California. And then with when one week, we had to figure out, you know, where to live. And so it came down to Palo Alto. And then afterwards, people told me that's very uncool. I should have lived in the city. Um, and then I realized, even though San Francisco was presumably close, that it was separated um, that I was separated from San Francisco um, by a highway that doesn't really work. And so um, I think my whole experience of San Francisco, I made it to, like, to San Francisco like five times in that time, I would say. Um, but I would say I have a really good time. And I remember spending, I remember spending, um, I remember the first time in life getting up at 5.30 because of a low tide. So we would go out to Santa Cruz and uh, go surfing on, you know, a beginner spot. I never made it to any accolades in surfing. Um, but I remember it was very appealing. Like, I, it, it had not have occurred to me to kind of get up at 5.30 just to catch the low tide and hang out in the water. And um, it certainly has been a, a memorable experience. So what got, me to, what got me to Palo Alto is that I worked for Xerox Park. And um, interesting period of my life. Um, I 
joined at a stock price of, uh, I, I interviewed at a stock price of 64 bucks a share. I took the job at, at 16 bucks a share and I moved on at $3 and 40 cents. And, um, so it turns out working for a research lab is a really good thing. As long as they have deep pockets, a research lab is a very expensive endeavor. And then when the stock price goes down, research labs get a little nervous. And uh, then people talk more about the bottom line and things like that. And, but fortunately, uh, so after, um, you know, being at Xerox Park, um, I did a bunch of interviews. I interviewed at IBM research. That was fun. That was the biggest number of individual interviews. I had 22 individual interviews, um, at four different management levels at IBM, uh, on the East coast, and then ended up, I remember one of them asked me, so IBM is more of a middleware company. Why wouldn't, you know, as a, as someone who does user facing software, why wouldn't you join Microsoft? And so I joined Microsoft. Um, so, and then I spent seven years at Microsoft research and then I actually, uh, and then actually went on to, uh, work for here at Hasselblad Platten Institute, which was actually interesting for me because even though I'm German, I hadn't really planned on, I, I had kind of made my, I, I had just figured out how to be happy in the U S and I realized that I like 19, 1900 pharma style houses. And I just figured out, you know, it takes a moment. The houses are different. And, uh, and then, then we decided to move back to Berlin and, uh, it was very interesting. So. Initially, I thought this was a quite a typical career, um, but then it turns out there's not that many people who did it that way. Actually, a bunch of people actually were in academia, joined, uh, visited Microsoft Research, and got stuck there. So they were professors, and then they were like, "Oh, great! I don't, you know, you work for Microsoft Research. Everyone does your travel expenses, and everything is easy. You've got a credit card for buying things. Super cool." Um, so I was one of the few people who moved in the opposite direction, and um, I think. In, I'm very happy I did in hindsight, even though, of course, I miss my, my, my you know, my friends and, and peers at, at these research labs. Um, but one of the things that allowed me to do is to kind of increase the scale of things I've been thinking about. So um, here's this oversimplified way of thinking of my career. By the way, I'm saying this because someone told me I should talk about my career, but maybe I should do this at the end. I don't know. Um, too late now. So. Um, I spent the first part of my career building a hundred small things that were good enough for 100 papers. And, um, when I took on the job at the Platten Institute, I instead traded that in for 10 projects and a 10 person years each. Right. And the, we just heard about five of them. Like one project was Stephanie one was Christian, one was Pedro. And so instead of writing a hundred pa papers by myself, I started to write 10 dissertations. In a way, I've got, I've got another five postdocs, so also professor now. So we've got a circle of alumni now of like, of like 10 professors. And that's very rewarding. It was very interesting for me to move from a stage where I thought about individual, like the nugget that a paper is to the next highest step of like, okay, I'm going to be working with this person for five years. What can we find out that is, that makes it worth to spend the five years on that. And I really like that. Um, and so you saw Stephanie, she's one of them. And then what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to do one project that's a hundred person years. So a hundred projects, one a year, 10 times 10, you know, and then like one times a hundred. So, uh, we've been working on personal fabrication. I've been asking myself, what would I have to do to kind of make, you know, push this to a point where I can perceive that as impact. If I look back, I said like, yeah, what I did actually was to make some change. And so, um. But maybe I should show some demos and we can revisit that question and maybe you just, you know, it's up to you. If you, if you agree with me, I'm excited about it, but let's see what you do. Okay. I've never used the software. I'm going to click on the share button and let me see what happens when I say, click share screen. Okay. Do you see a web browser with. Okay, cool. All right. So here's something we've been working on. And honestly, I just thought like, I didn't bring any slides today. I just thought I'd show that today. So. Mm. This is a simple software thing. Maybe you should start with a simple demo here. Uh, we've, been we've also published a bunch of papers on it, like five or six or so, but this certainly has, we put more time into this than, than these papers. Um, all right. If everything works, you should see a very slowly falling drop box right now. And, um, let me see, I'll try to make a very simple espresso machine. And if anyone recognized the interaction principle, if you've ever seen another software that kind of looks a bit like the same way, then let me know. By the way, something that just happened is, um, I don't know if that's interesting. Let me see, I actually go two steps back. 
Um, so here, what I'll talk about this a bit later, maybe, but like what the software just did, it recognized that this was not structurally sound and inserted an internal plate that I didn't quite ask for. Um, so there's some sorts happening in the scene. Um, so at this point, this may or may not remind you of Minecraft. Um, so I'm creating some sort of a 3D sculpture by um, by just stacking a couple of, of, you know, we call them voxels on top of each other. And um, as you can see here, I can round things. So we're still pretty much in Minecraft world, but it's not exactly Minecraft. So I can, for example, I can, for example, scale these things here. And now it's not, it's not just voxels anymore. It's some sort of a different shape. And, um, you know, so I can make modifications and let me, for good measure, I don't know if you recognize this as an espresso machine mock-up somehow, but, you know, so you put, put, put some sort of cup in here and then, um, let me see. So I like cubicle coffee because I'm from Seattle. And um, let me see if this works. All right, so I inserted two of them. Let me deal with one of them. So, oops. Everything is a little slower with the with the um, with the camera on at the same time, but I think you get the idea. Okay, so maybe that's what I want to do. Just a, a simple mock up with this. Um, so that's what I have. And so if I like this, I, what I can do now is I can say uh, laser cut this. And it's going to take a moment, a little bit longer because the video is running. And what it does now, it actually converts this 3D model to, um, uh, you know, it, it breaks it down into individual plates, which can then be sent to a laser cutter, which is a fabrication machine that is essentially an automated jigsaw. Let's look at what a laser cutter looks like. Okay, maybe that's the benefit of having PowerPoint, but I think we can figure this out. That's what it is. Oh, there's no way of getting feedback from you guys right now. I'm wondering how many of you have actually seen a laser cutter or operated one. Um, but maybe Stephanie talked about some too, I could imagine. So maybe that helps. So a laser cutter is a very simple machine. It's it's one that, you know, I think, you know, two of you and me, we could make one over, you know, with the right parts over a weekend. There's some sort of a laser source, which you buy. Um, then there's some mirrors that kind of mirror this around. And then some sort of a some sort of a carriage here that rides left and right and that rides on another carriage or two carriages that, that that move it back and forth the mechanism is known as a as a gantry and it's kind of a little bit what you see at ports sometime you have these big cranes that unload containers it's the same kind of construction and at the end is this kind of mirror and the lens that focuses the laser and it cuts and then you can do i didn't prepare this but that's what it looks like right so you can you can um you can cut these things there you are yeah that summarizes it nicely that's it so um so that's what i just did um so let me save this here and you see how it just took my espresso machine and laid this thing out and and stored it um and what i can do now is i can now um okay so one of the things that generated for example it generated not just the model uh but it also generated instructions so it generated here um a manual so this is what it just and this is all custom that didn't exist a minute ago um and it tells you in what order to assemble these to make sure you're not painting yourself into a corner as you kind of do this uh another thing that it does this is kind of interesting this is you will only appreciate that if you've ever tried to use one of these machines they all have different you know oh yeah okay i've got one here actually okay that's great i didn't anticipate that stop sharing for a second and show, show that live so um, you never quite know how much material the laser evaporates. So, so when the laser cuts things, it will remove a certain material. It's not just the two halves that there's something missing in the middle um, because the, the laser evaporates this material. And so what I can do now is I can, um, I ask myself, well, how much material was removed? And if I get this wrong, either I can't assemble the model because it's too tight or it will fall apart because it's too loose. I try to get this really just right. And so um this is just one of lots of nitty-gritty little details um this little thing allows me to try out different settings um it's not very bright here let me see if i so there's some sort of a scale on here and um i can insert this at various points 
And if I get to the point where like, oh, that's exactly how, like this feels pretty good to me here. That means it's just nicely, nice and tight right now. That's how I like the model. Then I read the value from this thing. And, and then in this case, it would be uh, 13. And then that tells me, that tells me that that's the folder I need to cut from. And as, 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 the, as lame as that looks, at least from my perspective, that's something that the field kind of needed. So these machines have been sold as industry machines. This stuff was invented in the 60s. Um, so the technology has been around for 55 years. And today when you buy these machines, the software they give you is called Draw. So you can make all these things. You can make all the things I just showed you, but the way you would make these is by just drawing all these little kind of angles by hand, and that's how you would do it. And so um, we've been exploring this. One of the reasons why we started was we felt like that's not how the field should progress somehow. Like, you know, in order for this, for this technology to work, we need something you know, that's a little bit more applied. I'll give more demos in a second, but let me tell you a little bit why we're doing this. So um, if you look at the nature of interactive systems, um, if you think of the 1940s, the first computers, they would have a bunch of switches, could be seven, eight, or nine, something in that range. And you would say like low, high, 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 low, 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 low. And then you push a button and then you end at one byte into memory. And then you would set the next couple of switches, you push the button again, you enter another byte. People quickly figured out that that was not very successful. I mean, it was successful, but it was kind of slow. So people start to read punched tape. Right, so you had like this this tape with holes in it. You may have seen that uh, early prototypes include. I've got some. Well, I, I said I'm not going to slide. So you just believe me. There's a tape with holes, and then they would read this, and that's a faster way of reading. And then people started to enter stuff on a keyboard, and it came out on a printer. And so you had the first kind of successful input-output interaction with one-dimensional thing called text. And then in the '60s and early '70s, people started to point. You know, there would be a graphics display. And things went from 1D to 2D, you would see the world as a 2D screen and we point on it with a mouse or a light pen or any of these things. And then maybe recently, more recently, I don't know if any of you have ever worn a VR headset. Things have gotten three-dimensional, also an invention from the 60s, by the way. This has been around for a long, long time. But now you can buy virtual reality headsets and you interact in 3D. You've got these two controllers, six degrees of freedom. You're wearing a 3D headset, very cool. So the, the history of interactive things has advanced from like, zero dimensions to one dimension, two dimension, three dimensions. And the question is what's next? Because I'm a researcher in human computer interaction and I'm wondering what will the world be like in 50 years? And so everyone's equally invited to guess. And my guess is the next step after 3D or could be more 4D, I think it's gonna be volumetric things. So I think it's gonna be about physical matter. And um, what makes that interesting, I think, is that, that as a computer scientist, when I started studying computer science in the, uh, in the late 80s, I think the general assumption was that a computer scientist would write things that are data in, data out. You have some sort of a program, it accepts data as input and produces data as output. But more recently, if you look at the evolution of 3D printers, you know, uh, laser cutters, milling machines, which are computer controlled, and you know, I'm, I assume that you know, Stephanie showed you a handful of those, um, it seems not so clear anymore if as a computer scientist that you'd be limited to a world of data. Maybe as a computer scientist, you could reach out and actually take control over some parts of the physical world. I find that very appealing because in some, when I got my high school degree, I initially, had I not gone to university, I would have become a carpenter. So I like the idea of, of physicality. I think that's really interesting. And I really like the idea, I like both. I like the idea of computer science because it scales really well. As a computer scientist, I can do things to thousands or hundred thousands or you know, hundreds of millions of people at the same time. I've I can have tremendous influence, which I really like. Um, but I also like the physicality of you know, being a carpenter, if you will. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to get these two things together um, and seeing how far this can go. The reason why I find this interesting is because this movement of dealing with these machines has been around for quite a while. Um, the person driving this, uh, his name is Neil Gershenfeld. He also hangs out at MIT at the Bits and Atoms Lab, which he leads. And um, Neil Gershenfeld, um, and I like him very much, and I'm a big fan of his. I've been to his class. We've had dinner in Berlin, all good. But I am not sure if, like, so what happens is that the number of fab labs, and I know this, like, you got tech shop, you got everything in, in, in the Bay Area. It's awesome. You got all the cool stuff. But the interesting question is how influential will fab labs be in the future? So one possible future is, well, 
you know, Fab Labs, the number of Fab Labs is going to grow. And sometime in the future, everyone will be a maker. Seems like a viable, you know, that seems like a reasonable assumption to make. And in many ways, I think the assumption that was made when 20 years ago, people started to create Fab Labs. Um, but we don't know. And so when you look at the number of Fab Labs, initially they kind of, you see the hockey sticks and how you see some sort of exponential growth, but it's been tapering off recently. So the number of Fab Labs, if you just take that as sort of a raw, you know, raw factor somehow, it's not clear. It's not, if you, let's just let this Fab Lab move and run for a very long time. It's not clear that the assumption will work that everyone will become a maker. And so, The, the, I mean, the competing hypothesis would be, well, not everyone will be a maker, maybe only the people who have a natural inclination to being an engineer. I feel very much at home at being a maker. I feel I'm having a good time at tech shop and, and uh, you know, any fab lab, wonderful. I love it very much. I love doing these types of projects, but it's not clear if it will reach everyone. So, um, and recently you saw, you know, we're 16 fab labs, 1800. I'm thinking it's gonna go to two and a half thousand. But it's not clear what comes out. Um, can you? And I, you know, I know there's lots of fab labs in the Bay Area, but it's not quite representative of the rest of the world. And there's Tech Shop, which I love. And but it's not clear how they're going to continue to grow. So what we've been asking ourselves, like, you know, what can we like? What's what are the possible futures of of the fab lab movement and on the maker culture? Where could it possibly go? And um, so one of the things we did for a while, we thought like, well, okay, and that's and that includes Stephanie and me for that matter. Well, let's start building software. Like that's a good idea. But more recently, we felt that's not quite enough. We actually need to do a full end-to-end -end kind of. That's at least a theory right now. Maybe it's not enough to just give people smart machines. Maybe the smart machines needs to come with smart software, and maybe the smart software needs to come with a smart curriculum. Um, very much. For example, for my daughter, I've got a daughter who's just turned seven. And we've got uh, Kiwico uh, things at home. I don't know if anyone has seen that stuff. I, I like it very much. I think that's very cool and very well worked out. Um, good contents. I really like that. All right. So to go back to this idea, this is where we came from. We were wondering how to, you know, how will this continue to go? I think as a scientist, if you've got the choice. So as a scientist, you kind of need to pick what you want to work on. And I really like the idea of working on something that's some sort of a tipping point, right? I could join some sort of a well-established fields like virtual reality. We've done a little of this at this. It wasn't well-established 15 years ago, but today it's really, really well-established. And uh, I could contribute a little bit, but if I pick something that's in sort of a turning point where it's like, well, the world could go this way. Maybe we're going to let this run in like 20 years. We're going to have not 1800 fab labs, but maybe 3000, you know, that's, that's ample. Um, or I could pick something that is, um, you know, if, but maybe if I contribute, maybe I could get this to like scale up a factor of 10. Maybe I can scale it to scale up a factor of 100. Maybe I can scale it to a factor of 1,000. And if I could do that, that would be very meaningful because all the work that I and everyone in my field had done would now apply to a 1,000 times more people. And I like this as a scientist. That's kind of one of the ideas that you want to do as a scientist. You want to, you know, influence the world. That's a little bit why you're doing this job. So... So, yeah, so I felt this could be interesting, right? I felt like the whole time, normally as a scientist, what you do is you build things just as a prototype, and then you wait for someone to come along and commercialize what you're doing. So we've been wondering if we should try to do this ourselves. So what I just showed you is something we're going to try to spin out next year. And uh, we're going to see, you know, if this, if this can change things. So let me tell you who we're doing this with. And uh, we're working with schools. So let me just show you. Let me look at this. Close this down. So here's here. Oh, I need to turn the um, sharing back on. Right. All right, you should see my screen again. And uh, so here we did a workshop. This was the first thing we did. That wasn't with students. That was with teachers at the time. And here the teachers. They all built. Ah, okay. I can always see the latest project here. Um, uh, we built cajones. Um, that was the first thing we did. And as part of this, we sent them through a sequence of different challenges. And then this workshop would be a two day format. We would start with a bunch of challenges, try things out. And the system we have is fast enough to allow building within a class. And we really like this idea. So, uh, as part of this, everyone had to design a series of guitar stands. So, 
they had to replicate this one and then design a, a fresh one. And then we would look at the things that were designed. And um, then in class, we would start fabricating some of these and could try them actually out. And then the next day we would have these things manufactured and people build them. There's a physical component to it. <laughs> and later on, more physical stuff, more physical stuff. You know, we would actually sample the, drop, the, uh, the drums. We would play the drums a little bit. And then what you don't see here is we do some scientific analysis. So people make a prediction says like, if I make my drum twice as deep, it sounds higher, lower, is it that it has more bass or the whole spectrum is shifted and so on. And then we just as a step into like scientific process, uh, we would kind of, you know, sample them and kind of validate and try, you know, uh, if we were actually right with a speculation. Um, all right, let me show you another one. And uh, okay, here's my favorite one right now. And if I walk around, I could show you lots of broken guitars. Um, uh, what's fun about this is whenever we show this, what we're doing here to guitar makers, so that's part of what we do. Oops, I can't show this yet. Um, we always bring in some experts to develop content with them. And so we've been talking to four different sets of guitar makers at this point. And whenever we talk to non-guitar makers, their first question is, does it sound good? And when we talk to guitar makers, their first question is, does it break? Because it turns out making a guitar that doesn't break is very hard, I know, because we've broken three of them so far and made seven that haven't broken yet. Um, all right, let me show you, let me show you what this class is like. And, you know, what we think what teaching could be like. So any workshop in that case ends with something being built. So this is, this is actually a good example. It's like half German, half, half American. This is, um, Schenker is his name. He is the guitar from an eighties, nineties, whatever rock band called the Scorpions. Um, and here's some sort of a wide guitar. So the, the last challenge is just an invitation for every student to make an unusual guitar, uh, for themselves to take home. And the question is, well, how do you do that? Because making a guitar is not that easy. So if I just give out the challenge, make a guitar, there's two possible outcomes. Either nothing will work or people will replicate something very canonical because they don't understand what they're allowed to change and what they need to replicate. So what we do is before we do that, um, we go through a bunch of different challenges, each of which illustrate one point. So uh, the first one is, you know, a simple, like the lamest example you could possibly think of. Um, so a so-called monochord is just like, uh, you get a guitar string, you just have to mount it in a way that you can, you can hit it. Like, um, you can strike it and then you see if you get some sound out. And the answer is yes, you get the sound out and depending on where you put that green triangle, the frequency goes up and down. And honestly, you've seen this in every, you know, in every science museum, you would see that. Um, now the question is what comes next? And the answer is, well, you can hear something, but it doesn't sound good because you don't hear very much. And if we could see each other right now, I would ask you, why do you not hear anything? But um, in the lack of interactivity, I'll just tell you, you don't hear much because the string is very thin and very, the air is not a very viscous medium. So in order to hear something, I need to get air molecules excited. And so this little, this guitar string is too thin. It just hits a very few, small number of air molecules. These are air molecules hit other air molecules and that ultimately reaches my ear, but it's just so few of them that I don't hear very much as the, the volume of what I hear decreases uh, squared with distance. Okay, so don't hear very much. So there's two possible ways of moving forward. And these are the next challenges. The next one is, well, I can electrify the whole thing. I just get myself some random guitar pickup and put it in here. And the cool thing about the guitar pickup is it doesn't need to be loud because it doesn't actually listen to sound. It just, it's a, it's a magnetic field and watches the, it watches the string uh, move within that uh, magnetic field. And that's good enough. And so I can put a big uh, amplifier behind it and I can make as much noise as I want. And I can play, you know, some sort of three chord heavy metal music with it, um, with the right amplifier. Uh, the other solution is a little bit more difficult. I can start building a resonance body. So I need to build some sort of a box and that box, the vibration is now transmitted onto the box. The box vibrates and that will actually now cause more air molecules to move because the box is big enough and that big movement will ultimately reach my ear. I hear something. So, okay. Now at this point, if I really like bluegrass music or steel, like, you know, I think some sort of old country with like steel guitars, that's the ticket. I could just sit down and play on this thing right now and play some tunes. Many people don't think that particularly fashionable. So you might prefer an instrument that allows you to stand up. So 
Um, this has two benefits. If I start making an instrument that I hold in my hand, number one is, you know, I can stand up with it and rock it out a little bit more than I do with my steel guitar. And the second thing is my left hand actually can contribute to making music and that makes the whole thing more expressive. And that's really important. So if you look back at the history of string instruments, there's some string instruments that are like Zita, for example, something that I'm guessing would have been played in Austria. Um, but it's always the same note because you hammer onto these strings. But on a guitar, the left hand does a lot of things. You can play bends and slides and all these cool things and muffling the strings. And so you actually get much more expressiveness out, which is cool. So we're getting much closer to the idea of a guitar. And I've got a, yeah, I've got a bunch of these here. And so, but what you need to figure out here, the moment you do this, the resonance body have to move to this one side. And now you have the problem that that neck is very likely to break. So that's, so the first exercise we did was, the first question was, well, how do you mount a string? The next was, well, how do you, you know, how do you, how does a pickup work? The third one was the question, how do you do resonance? And now the fourth one is, is structural engineering. So you need to somehow make sure this neck doesn't break off. And that's the standard one-on-one -on -one exercise in architecture. Um, a classic one would be you have to build a spaghetti bridge. And I don't know, maybe you did that in school at some point. Um, you're given like a, you know, a three foot distance, you know, two pounds of a mass on top of it and, and some inappropriate building material such as paper or spaghetti. And you have to bridge that distance and you have to discover the, the basic laws of how, how structural engineering works, such as thickness counts cubed while width counts only linear. So, Making the net wider doesn't buy you much. You need to make it thicker, but you also need to make sure, you know, these things are properly done. So you learn something about structural engineering. Now, at this point, we again, we're getting closer and closer to making an actual guitar. The, the next thing is frets. I would love to ask you if anyone knows why you make frets, but in the absence of that, here's why you need frets. If you play a single string, you can tune it. Like if you, if you play a violin, for example, you put your finger down roughly where you think it should be. And then you move it up and down a little bit to kind of get the exact note. And if you have good hearing, which I don't, uh, then you get a nice note out. But you can't do this with a chord. If you put four fingers or five fingers down at the same time, there's just no way you're going to tune all of those at the same time. That's what the frets give you. So you put these metal things over your guitar, and if you get it right, you can now, uh, you know, you can now play multiple things at the same time. Now, what's interesting about this is where do you put your frets? And I brought you an example. We didn't do this. It's someone on the internet. If you just look at this for a moment, it's a very interesting fretboard, I find. So, well, there's two things to notice. Number one, the distance is not the same. So here it's longer than it's shorter and it's longer and what's going on here. And then that's the really interesting one here. Right here, that's weird. Normally you expect these frets to go through, but they don't. So what this person did is that person did a guitar that, oh, yeah, I don't know if that's the guitar or bass here. Uh, that you can play in G major perfectly tuned. It's called just tuning. And then what you normally have on any other type of instrument, instrument is actually coming not far from where I am right now. Uh, this was Johann Sebastian Bach, who kind of came up with the idea. He said, well, you know, if, if I do my frets, if I distribute them evenly, I'm actually not really learning, uh, I'm, like these are all wrong. I mean, the octave is correct. That's the only one, everything else is wrong but they're pretty close. Um, so the benefit is I can play any key I want. I can move them up, no other fret parties I want at the expense of none of them actually being right. So when I learned to play the guitar, I was always, I always thought it was me when I tuned it so that E minor was sounding good, D major always sounded like garbage. And I always thought it was me until I realized, no, it's, it's, it's Bach's fault. He did this. So if you make your own guitar, you can choose what you want, right? Maybe, you're a fan of Middle Eastern music, and then you don't have 12 frets per octave, but you have 24 of them. Or you want to play, you know, you play bluegrass, and you're going to play G major anyways. That's all you're going to do. So you're going to tune it to G major, and it's going to sound better than any instrument you've ever had. Um, but you cannot play anything else but G major. Then. So that means the next lesson, if you will, here is tuning, right? So we just talked about structural engineering. Now we're talking about tuning. So. All right, the next steps are more straightforward. This is a design we found on the internet. It's a very simple electric guitar with a pickup, um, pretty straightforward. And, uh, oh shit, uh, uh, I forgot how long, what's the format? Because Stephanie mentioned something about, there's a break or something or? No. No, no break, maybe an hour, about an hour. I see, okay, all good, okay. Um, 
so um right so that's a simple electric guitar design electric guitars are not super difficult to do because the shape doesn't really matter for that matter um so you can just do that and then the next thing is like build a simple acoustic guitar what you don't see is something called bracing which is under the, the soundboard here which uh, has a structural function of preventing it from breaking but also uh, adds to the sound and then the, the next thing is uh, a western guitar uh, which actually contains a steel spring hidden in the neck that makes it more sturdy, called the truss rod. And when you've done through these things, then essentially you've, you know, now you can make your own, you know, acoustic guitar and you have a rough idea what to do. And now you're invited to elaborate. If you went down the electric route, maybe you want to, that's a separate workshop. Maybe you want to go build a speaker with that goes with the guitar. And otherwise, you're just going to start thinking about designing a guitar, which may have the shape or may be something completely different. But ideally, at this point, you have um, kind of a little bit of the background knowledge you need uh, to understand why it is. You need to understand why the bridge is there. You know, the, the bridge is, 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 um, is this thing here. Uh, the bridge is the very most important point of the guitar, if you will. It translates the vibration of the string onto the soundboard, which then kind of resonates. There you go. So that's, that's, that's an example of what we think of as a workshop. And um, so the reason why we think this is interesting is um, because we think that we can go past the complexity typically built in fab labs. We think we can make more ambitious projects that actually where, you, where students learn not just making per, per se, not just how to operate the laser cutter, but actually uh, I can embed le lessons from architecture and music and you know, all these other kind of disciplines, create something interdisciplinary and reasonably complex. Um, all right, and that's what we've been doing. So here's a couple of examples. I don't need this one anymore. Um, Yeah, airplanes are fun too. We're working on airplanes right now. Here's a workshop we did with some seventh graders. Um, a few things that came out of it. So they all kind of designed their own loudspeakers. Um, here's my favorite project. Oh, okay, we don't. That's my daughter Philippa. And um, and uh, for for them we did something. Let me just show this in a. Actually, show this in a different. So. Yeah, here, this is kind of interesting. That's what we're doing right now. Uh, we're trying to reach people in more than elementary school. So we're doing this material. This is foam core. You may have used this in the past for making poster boards. And we're using the laser cutter to not cut all the way through, but just partially. And we get something where all the parts stick together. So it's something that assembles very, very quickly. Let me run this again. And it's very addictive. It's a bit wrap. You first have to peel out these little corners there, and then you fold this up. And um, so we're exploring how to take this both to disciplines where the look matters because it's white, right? So we can use it for industrial design or architecture, but also for like, um, you know, kids in, in their earlier stages and kind of make these projects. And actually, I've, I've got one here to look at the camera. I love that stuff. It's very addictive. So um, I think I've shown most of the system what I wanted to show. Um, so. The reason we let, well, maybe the last thing to explain is how we got going with the schools. So I told the story from my perspective. I'm an engineer and a, and a scientist. I'm really interested in the transition of technology into the future. I'm wondering, I, as a person who works on interactive system, what do I have to do to influence the future? And I think after we've seen the transition from text to graphics to 3D, I think that vol volume, physical mass, could be the next step. Maybe I'm wrong, and then you will never hear from me again. Obviously, that's the that's the fate of a scientist. If you guess wrong, well, then you just you lose, right? But it's better to guess than not to guess, right? You need to make you put your money onto something. So you make some sort of a wild guess. You make some prediction of the future, and then for your career, you just assume that that's true. You try to get to the office every morning. You don't doubt that. You just move forward on it. And I think there's a good chance that the same way that other areas of the you know, there's lots of areas that used to be independent of computing that turned into computing. So, for example, text editing used to be something. If I submit a paper, they ask me for a camera ready copy. Where's the camera? Well, there used to be a camera like 40 years ago. Um, the very first time I submitted a paper in 1996, um, I actually, I think they still did that. 
they laid out the paper and then they put the page numbers on it as paper snippets and they put some sheet of glass over it and took a photograph and that went to some lino to kind of you know to be printed today obviously uh printing is completely digital at this point so so this 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 pattern that i just showed you that like some sort of the presence of a 3D scanner and a 3D printer or like some scanner and a laser cutter and these things. I see of that as a pattern. And for me, this reminds me of other tr transitions I've seen in the past, such as people at a scanner and people at a laser printer. Gary Stock, where the former colleague of mine invented laser printing at Xerox Park actually, and was at Microsoft Research later, and it really changed the field. Postscript made everything portable. And at some point, the entire field became digital. Uh, video editing, just around the corner from you. I mean, you guys are at a super cool spot because all this action happened just around the corner from where you are. And if you ever have a chance, make sure to get a tour of Xerox Park. Um, I was there way later than that, so I, am, I have no contribution to any of this glorious history. Um, uh, another funny anecdote is in, 19, in, the, uh, in the 1970s, as you know, the, the Xerox also came out of Xerox Park, which was the, the first personal computer. In the 1960s, also in the, in the Silicon Valley, uh, Doug Engelbart, who's kind of the biggest hero of the field of interactive computing, um, he gave a demo known as the mother of all demos. Um, and uh, he just showed a system that interactively allowed him personally to interact with the computer. Very, very cool. I mean, completely lame from your perspective because it completely happened. You probably, and he had this idea, he said, like, what happened if people had an interactive computer system at their disposal? What could you as an intellectual worker do if you had that? Now, the cool thing is you guys are kind of intellectual workers and you kind of have a computing system at your disposal that is instantly, instantly responsive. It's the phone in your pocket, right? So he was the first before that people used computing in a very different way. So he had this idea that you could do that rather than buying a computer to do weather forecasts or some other super specialized application, people would have a general purpose computer that helps them think better. And if you look around or just look into your pocket, you can see that that actually turned out to be true. And so then the seventies, people at Xerox Parks added the graphical user interface to that and the idea of pointing on things with the mouse, which Engelbart already had a little bit of. And they created the Alto and then the star. And then they, in, the, in between, they invited Steve Jobs, who kind of ripped the whole thing off. And then my former boss, Bill Gates, ripped them off. And so there's this history of ripping off somehow. And, um, and the, the nice anecdote I want to tell is um, there was a guy called Dick Schaub, and his, he had this idea of using computers for video editing. He would have his artist friends over at night, and they would digitize a couple of frames of videotape into the computer. Uh, spend the night painting around in it and write it back to tape the next morning. And the people who just invented the personal computer threatened to fire him because that was such a waste of company resources. Um, he invented digital video editing. He also invented the multi-billion dollar business, which also Xerox made zero benefit of because they didn't get, they, they didn't get that, Xerox didn't get that personal computing was the next big thing. And then the people who did the personal computing thing didn't get that video editing was the next big thing. Uh, but in all of these things, I see patterns. I see things where like something was an analog process, someone threw in two parts, which is something that digitizes contents and something that makes it analog afterwards. And I see that same pattern today in fabrication. That pattern changed print, that, that, that pattern changed video editing, that pattern changed sound editing, right? I mean, you can all have a sound studio today at home and you can make sound, you can record, you can remix, you can publish all these things as part of your mobile phone for all I know. And so I think I recognize this pattern and I'm randomly betting without any evidence that the next thing where I see this pattern is going to be in personal fabrication. It could be in 3D printing and it could be in laser cutting or any of those. And I personally am convinced enough to kind of invest my work into this and see if I can drive this forward. The reason this is working with schools right now is, and maybe that's the conclusion of this, is the schools have kind of a separate, almost inverse problem to that. And I don't know about you guys, the problem that the schools are having is they are, um, they see their kids, and I guess that's you guys, wander off into the digital world and the school can't quite follow. And at least some of the schools I've talked to, that causes them pain. Um, it's a really weird thing. I can fully relate to that. So the school cannot, it's not allowed to follow. If the school went, followed you down TikTok and whatever it is, the school could not fulfill its purpose that society is, has, has, they, 
schools are on a mission. Society has given them a mission to prepare people for the physical world. They have to do that. And they can't follow you into the digital world. And that leaves some tension that makes that creates makes them uneasy for good reasons. And so uh, what we're trying to do with the software I just showed you right now, which is just the first stepping stone of the different things we're planning to do, is we're working with schools to help them bring analog and digital together. So what we do is the, uh, the, the students build in a digital way using the tools I just showed uh, in a web browser, on a tablet, on a phone, they, create, they, they construct things, but then there's always a physical phase afterwards. And we, f we feel that with some of the people we work with that this alleviates that pain because it kind of closes, it brings the chasm, it closes some of the chasm and brings analog and digital back together. And so that's what we're exploring right now. That's what we like. So, and if you have any thoughts on that and any input, something I should look at or so, I'll be very happy to, you know, get your emails on that. And that would be the end of my talk. All right, thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. Uh, from the format and everything was unexpected and very interesting, at least from my perspective. So now, um, so now I'm opening the Q and A ses session, and for that one, I stopped the recording. Okay. <laughs>